YouTube where they have the filament. Um, okay, so the, the meeting has been recorded now. So you have uh, the, uh, the filament generating electron, which are actually accelerated by the, by, uh, um, the voltage in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a tube, in a, in a glass tube where this vacuum is made. And uh, the accelerator can also be deflected by, by electrodes. And in fact, it was the electron striking uh, a material that was actually producing what is called Bremsstrahlung radiation, essentially X-rays. So this is uh, a, a, an image taken from a very interesting book, which was actually published for the, um, at the, 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 the century of the uh, discovery of X-rays and, and they're using medicine. Uh, this is just uh, one of the X-ray tubes, which, which were already available in the early 1900 uh, for uh, actually uh, producing X-rays for, uh, for medical imaging. So X-rays were actually used for medical imaging uh, immediately uh, after the discovery. Now, the major, one of the major tools that is used now in medicine is the cyclotron. We will come back to this uh, later on when we discuss radio cap production. The cyclotron was actually invented, I mean, built, the first one was built in 1930 by, by Lawrence. <coughs> and uh, we will go a little bit through the operating principle, but essentially it is a, a big electromagnet. And in between the poles, there's a vacuum chamber where um, you had uh, two or more electrodes two are shown in this figure. Uh, to these electrodes, an alternated uh, electric field, uh, radio frequency field is, a, a field is applied, which is used to accelerate particles. So the magnetic field will bend the particle into a, a circular orbit, which becomes a spiral. And the um, RF field applied to the electrodes accelerate the beam. We'll come back to that in a few slides. Um, so this was actually invented in the 30s. And uh, more or less in the same years, uh, in 1932, Chadwick discovered the neutron, which is one of the two um, constituents of uh, the nucleus. You know, essentially, apart from uh, the, the hydrogen, all of the uh, atomic nuclei, they are made by uh, a, a mixture of protons and neutrons. And we've seen, you know, last week, the, you know, the, the the fact that the um, you know the 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 the, the, uh, the ratio between these two varies with the with the with the um, z of the atoms, right? And in fact, it was only after a few years from the discovery of the neutron that you know it was found that you can actually produce neutrons in a cyclotron by bombarding um, a target with the protons are accepted by the machine, <clears throat> and immediately, I mean. Uh, Practically at the moment, I mean, the same years, they, 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 they were attempted by Stone and Lawrence, who was actually the brother who, of uh, the Lawrence who invented the cyclotron. Uh, Lawrence here was, was actually a medical doctor. They tried to use uh, fast neutrons for uh, radiation therapy of cancer with results which were pretty bad at the time because, uh, well, first of all, they had no knowledge at all of the uh, radiobiological effectiveness of neutrons that we saw last week and that we'll see again later on, uh, in, on, on Thursday. They are very much more uh, uh, prone to uh, damage tissue than, for instance, uh, the X-rays from the, you know, from Röntgen tube. And there were absolutely no knowledge of the radiobiology of neutrons. And in addition, neutrons are extremely difficult to collimate. So, um, in fact, the, the, the first results uh, of neutron therapy, of fast neutron therapy, were rather a disaster. They will, they will stop uh, rather soon. And only in the 50s, when the first medical cyclotron was installed at the Hamilton Hospital in London, um, uh, fast neutron therapy were resumed under uh, more uh, control experimental conditions and with the better knowledge of uh, radiobiology. The, the other accelerator, which uh, has found a lot of application in the medical field, and we'll see better next, I mean, on Thursday, the, the next lecture we'll discuss uh, um, uh, radiation therapy, <coughs> is actually the synchrotron. Now, the, whereas the cyclotron is an accelerator for protons, so you do not accelerate electrons in a cyclotron, 
we will see the the electron version if you allow to the cyclotron in a few slides but the cyclotron as it is it's a proton machine well it's a, it's an ion machine you can accelerate protons you can accelerate uh, uh, other ions but not electrons the synchrotron exists in both versions so in uh, in 1954 the first proton synchrotron was built in berkeley in the us and in a few years later in frascati in close close to home in italy um, they built the first electron synchrotron so you can actually a version of the two um, uh, for for the two type of, of of particle light and heavy and in fact i mean the construction i mean the the, the construction of the, the synchrotron was actually um made possible by the discovery of the principle of phase stability, which is essentially a fundamental uh, principle in particle isolation techniques that would actually allow to keep a beam of particles. A beam is made of billions of particles that has to travel together inside a small vacuum chamber guided by magnets and they should be kept together and focused uh, without the you know leaving you know the reference orbit. So the, the the principle of phase stability is a fundamental principle in particle acceleration. Now there are at present something like forty thousand particle accelerators worldwide, um, and the applications are essentially um, three. We have um, scientific research medical application and industrial acceleration. And here you have this summary table, you have a little bit of a uh, uh, summary of those. And so the, um, essentially, the accepted use in research, in size, are a comparatively minor number with respect to all the others. So most of them are actually used in research. So here you see the, the amount used, for instance, in uh, about 27,000 out of the 41,000. Many are very small machines, which are electron accelerated by um, really accepted electron to a couple of hundred kV. <clears throat> a few are accepting electrons at high energy. Um, there are small machines for um, ion implantation, for ion beam analysis. Some are to generate neutrons. And then the, the second large uh, category is electron machine, uh, sorry, is a particle accelerator for medicine which make about 14,000, about one third of the accepted worldwide are actually using medicine. Um, most of them are electron Linux for, um, for radiation therapy. Uh, a small part are proton cyclotron or uh, proton synchrotron or ion synchrotron for advanced radiation therapy, what is called hadron therapy that we will see at the last bit of uh, the lecture on Thursday. And a quite a good number, more than a thousand now. This is actually 2014, so this number certainly has grown up in the meantime. So that probably now we're closer to 45 or 50,000. But it's a good fraction of small cyclotron that are used to produce red nuclide for uh, um, medical diagnosis mostly. Um, so this is just the same information by simply um, looking at the growth with time. So you've seen. Um, Whereas, you know, the use in science has more or less remained constant since the mid 90s. The use in uh, medicine or in industry is, is constantly growing. So it's really going up. And I always classify accelerators for medicine in three big categories, and which I already anticipated. In fact, one is this low energy cyclotron for uh, producing radionuclide for either imaging, for PET or SPECT, we will see the difference between the two in a moment, or for um, uh, targeted radionuclide therapy. Then we saw that the largest fraction of the medical accelerator are uh, electron Linux, which are used in what I call conventional radiation therapy to uh, discriminate uh, from hadron therapy. Conventional radiation therapy doesn't mean that it's not effective. Um, uh, radiation therapy with electron Linux has reached uh, a very advanced stage. And we see a few examples. You have very, very sophisticated machines for very, very sophisticated treatment planning 
uh, for um, irradiating cancer uh, in a very selective way. And then the third class is this um, sort of a bigger and more expensive and more complex accelerator, which are medium energy cyclotrons and synchrotron for what we call hadron therapy. So therapy uh, done with beams of hadrons, it is also called particle therapy. And typically um, it is either protons up to 250 MeV or light ion beams and practically it's carbon, carbon ions. So at the moment, hadron therapy is undertaken by either protons or carbon ion beams, 250 MeV protons or 400 MeV per nucleon carbon ions. And we will see in the, the lectures on Thursday, some uh, accelerators which are used for this, uh, beam delivery, and also some new concepts, because this is a rather expensive technology with respect to you know, uh, electron linear. So there are uh, developments which tend, which are you know, meant to, to decrease the cost and, and to make this type of uh, radiation therapy more generally available. Normally, the operation of accelerators from a point onwards is dictated by relativity. So except for the very small um, cyclotrons uh, that are used for um, uh, producing radionuclides, um, more or less all of the other machines are relativistic. And of course, I mean, at the far end of this plot, you find the CERN accelerator. So the CPS is the CERN proton synchrotron, which is actually proton to 26 GeV the SPS accelerate uh, proton to 400 GeV, the LHC to 7 TV. Um, the medical machine rather sit on the other side, so in the growing part of this curve. As, as essentially, I mean, these curves relate the amount of energy into, you know, of the beam that you accelerate in a machine with the, with the, with the, with the, with the increase in, in the velocity. And you all know the E equal MC square relation by Einstein, which simply tells you that when you start accelerating a proton, for instance, in, a, in an accelerator, well, in the beginning, the, um, all of the energy that you provide to the particle, it's practically converting to velocity. So it follows the classical law of Newton. The, Kinetic energy is, uh, is given by this formula, which is directly proportional to the mass of the particle and the, and the square to the velocity. But the point is that this process cannot go on forever because there is a limit that you cannot exceed, which is this famous uh, uh, value of the velocity of light, which is 300,000 um, kilometers per second in vacuum, which is less in any medium. So assuming when you accelerate particles in a machine that you're actually accelerating them in vacuum. It's not a strictly speaking vacuum, but uh, it's, it's a vacuum chamber where, you know, the residual gas is a very, very low pressure. Well, at a certain point, you, you know, you cannot longer uh, simply have a linear relation between, um, you know, the, the energy you provide and the, and, the, and the velocity because the velocity of the particle approaches this limit, which cannot be exceeded by any particle provided with, 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 with mass. So very soon, you will have a deviation from this linear trend, linear behavior. And in fact, what happens that uh, the, the, the highest is the energy that you provide, the kinetic energy that you provide to the, uh, to the, uh, to the particle, the largest is the fraction of the energy that does not go any longer in, in increasing the speed, but we rather increase the mass. The kinetic energy will still increase, but what happens, the velocity of the particle will uh, approach a, um, a steady value, which is getting closer and closer to the velocity of light, and the excess energy do you, do you keep uh, supplying will go into mass. And this as an impact on the operation of accelerator because uh, if here, for instance, in this, in this region here, you can have a radio frequency system that works at a constant frequency, well, this is no longer valid, for instance, in this part. So the machine becomes, say, relativistic, and the, 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 you know, the relativity has to be taken into account while you design a machine. For electrons, uh, electrons are much uh, lighter than protons. 
uh, so that they reach the velocity very close to the velocity of light very, very soon, way before uh, a, a proton, because the, the rest mass of an electron is 511 kV, the rest mass of a proton is nearly, nearly one GeV. So now we start the uh, part on the radon cloud production that we we'll discuss uh, uh, today, and we we'll leave radiation therapy uh, for Thursday. Um, so the the use of radionuclides in um, in, uh, in physical and biological sciences can be broken down into three major categories: <clears throat> the radio tracers. Um, uh, they can be used also for environmental studies, for instance. Um, imaging, which is represent ninety five percent of the medical uses, essentially for SPECT and PET. So some of the nuclei like uh, technetium ninety nine, Tastable, thallium two hundred one, iodine one two three, are using single photon emission computer tomography. Uh, some radionuclides which are beta emitters like carbon eleven, natrium thirteen, oxygen fifteen, fluorine eighteen, are using poison emission tomography. There is a small fraction of radionuclide which are using for um, uh, therapy, radiation therapy of cancer, <clears throat> either for brachytherapy, like palladium 103, or for what is called targeted radiation therapy, like astatine or bismuth. Now, the physical parameters which are important depends on the application of the radionuclide. So, and the, and the physical parameters are the type of emission. You don't want to use alpha or beta plus to do imaging. You want a pure gamma emitter, whereas you want alpha or beta plus to do, for instance, targeted therapy. The energy of the emission, it's important. The half-life, you want a radionuclide which has a short half-life to do imaging because you don't want to give residual dose to the patient when the exam, the examination is finished. But you want a longer half-life for a radionuclide for therapy because the radionuclide must keep uh, irradiating the tumor. And the radiation dose is actually linked, actually dictated by the parameter involved, by the type of emission, the energy of the emission, the half-life. All radionuclide which are used in nuclear medicine, the, the branch of medicine that uses radionuclides either for uh, diagnostics or for therapies called nuclear medicine, are all artificially produced. And there are three production routes or mechanisms. You can use nuclear reactors to produce radionuclides with the neutron capture reaction. So you can do a, an N gamma capture reaction. The resulting radionuclide has the same chemical properties of the, uh, of the target element because you just include a neutron, you do not change the number of protons in the, in the nucleus but as uh, difficult chemical uh, physical properties because the weight of the nuclear is different. Otherwise, you can exploit fission in nuclear reactor in which a heavy nucleus splits into two or more fragments. And one of these fragments uh, can be, use, can be uh, used for medicine so that you have to separate the useful radionuclide from the rest. Or you can use a cyclotron uh, with the you bombard with, the, with protons, for instance, or neutrons, alpha particle, a target. So you have a charged particle induced nuclear reaction. And then the uh, residual nucleus is usually different chemically from the, from the target because you have a typically a PN or P2N reaction. And there is actually an advantage in that. So let's come back now to, to discuss machine accelerator. So the, 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 the accelerator which is used in uh, essentially to produce a nuclide is the cyclotron. I already told you what a cyclotron, uh, you know, what are the main components. Uh, typically, the energy at which you want to accelerate particle depends on what radio you want to produce. So this is an example of a Scanditronic MC40, which is a 40 mev uh, proton cycle. They can also accelerate uh, neutrons, helium-3 and alpha particle to produce a broad range of uh, radionuclides. And the basic operating principle of the, of a, of a, uh, of a cyclotron, but also for a synchrotron that we will see later on. I mean, actually on Thursday we discuss uh, radiation therapy, so keep this in mind. We'll come back to the slide. It's based on the um, equilibrium of uh, the forces uh, produced by the magnetic field. So the um, 
the magnetic field is in and out of the plane of this light. So in fact, this is the orbit of a charged particle, uh, which is um, located in between the polar expansion of a magnet. So you will have a, a force produced by the, by the magnetic field that will tend to uh, pull the magnet uh, toward the middle of the orbit, and you will have the, um, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the force uh, produced by the accession of the particle that will, that will uh, tend to have the particle escaping, and the equilibrium of the two will keep the particle circulating on a closed orbit. So here, I'm not going to go into the, this, the details of this formula. You have them there, so you can go back and have a look. <clears throat> but essentially, you have these two forces. And the equilibrium of these two forces will keep the particle um, orbiting. And the, um, the, um, so P is the momentum of the particle, the product of the mass by its velocity. And the B rho is what is called the magnetic rigidity of the particle. And this is actually an index of how difficult it is to bend the motion of a charged particle by the magnetic field. And it would actually tell you also that the highest is the energy of your particle, while the high has to be the magnetic field to keep the particle on the same orbit. Rho is the residual curvature, or you simply have to let the particle jump on, on, a, on a bigger orbit. And there is a very neat relationship between the, um, the B rho and the, um, the energy or the momentum um, that the particle can reach. In other words, if you want to have a, a beam of particle with higher energy in a circular machine, you have only two options. Either you increase the magnetic field or you increase the radius of the orbit. And since the magnetic field as a limitation, uh, a good uh, room temperature magnet will give you a field of very maximum to Tesla if it's super well designed, most likely maybe 1.8. Well, then, I mean, the given uh, uh, if you want to use classical magnets, room temperature magnets uh, to accelerate the particle, the only thing you can do if you want to accelerate to high energy to, uh, to increase the rho, which means that your synchrotron in this case will become bigger or your cyclone will become bigger. In, a, in the, a machine like the Large Hadron Collider, where the, the, the magnets are all superconducting, the, you can reach uh, you know, you know, 8, 9, 10 Tesla. So you can actually keep the machine more compact. But again, if you want to go to very high energy, like 7 Tev, well, I mean, the, the LHC has a, has a radio of several kilometers. There's, there's, there's no magic about that. So the, the B roll would also tell you, you know, which is the maximum momentum or kinetic energy that you can reach in a given machine, given the magnetic field and given the radius. So the cyclotron we see is essentially a magnet, an electromagnet. So we're in between the polar expansion, you have a vacuum chamber. And inside the vacuum chamber, you have two electrons, which are called these. And again, the trick here is that you reach isochronism because you have the formulation here, you can have a, it's a really classical physics, it's very simple, you can go through, but the, the point, the basic point is then you, when you, when you, when you have the sword that, that, that um, ejects particle at the center of, of, the, of, the, of the vacuum chamber, this particle will be in an electron field because this D will be, for instance, this is a proton, you will have this D at the positive, positive uh, uh, voltage and this will be negative, so the proton will be pulled toward the D, when it enters the D, which is actually uh, hollow, it will be screened by the electric field. It will only uh, uh, feel the magnetic field, so it will follow a circular orbit given by the formula we saw before. When it comes out of the electric of the uh, uh, D, the, um, the electric field, which is a radio frequency field, uh, will have inverted the polarity, so it will feel again an accepting force because this D will now be negative, the one in front will be positive, will pull in. And it will, the process will continue forever. Every time, well, forever until you know, the end of the exit of process. So every time you, the particle goes through the, the Ds, it will get a kick, it will get uh, an additional energy. So because it is more energetic, it will jump into a larger orbit. So it will like to make the next 
the next um, half turn will be longer because we'll be on a, on a Norway which will keep increasing, but it will be faster. And the trick is that the time will be the same. So we'll always come back in the classical approximation to the accelerating electrode always in phase with the radio frequency. So if the, if the, if the will be a rational acceleration because the frequency of the radio frequency system will be in phase with the um, um, revolution frequency of the particle uh, because the, 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 as I said, the, the will be faster and faster, but it will also um, complete a, bi a bigger orbit. At the end, the particle can be extracted, will be, can be shot into a target. Uh, this machine accelerates protons or uh, charged particles. In the same machine, you can accelerate protons or you can accelerate uh, different types of ion, provided the parameter tuned. Um, this is the maximum energy per nucleon that you can reach. So in fact, if you take protons, for instance, where the Z is one, A is one, the maximum energy that you can reach is K, which is, uh, is proportional, again, gets to the B rho. As we said, that is a fundamental parameter. So if B is in Tesla and N is in meters, the maximum energy, the, proton, the maximum proton energy in MeV that you can act, reach in a cyclone is 48 B rho square. So if you have a, for instance, a, a magnetic field of uh, one Tesla and the radius of one meter, the maximum energy you can reach is 48 meters. And you can tune this parameter according to, 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 what, to, to, to what you want to reach. Now, this is, a, you know, I'm not going to go into too many details, but the point is, well, as I said before, a, 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 a particle accelerator is not, I mean, uh, it's not accelerating one single particle, it's accelerating billions of particles clustered together. So in order to have them staying in the mid-plane of the machine on an orbit, the magnetic field is shaped in a way which is slightly decreases at the edge, so that a particle that will deviate from the reference orbit will experience a force produced by its velocity and by the magnetic field that will bring them back into the middle plane. So in fact, this is called a weak focusing machine because the focusing of the beam, unlike in synchrotron that we will see on Thursday, is actually produced by the, you know, the particular conf conformation of the magnetic field. The problem is that this only works until a certain energy that in cycle is around 15, 20 mev. Because, as I said before, while you accelerate, in the first few MeV, the, the beam is not relativistic. So it will, you know, with the in, in linear increase in the energy will translate it into a linear increase of velocity. But as, as you go up in energy, when you reach a couple of times of MeV, not all the energy goes into in an increase in velocity. So the velocity will, will start, say, increasing at a lower rate. So the revolution frequency of the particle will also slightly decrease. And at a certain point, will be no longer in phase with the frequency of the accelerator, accelerator system. So the, you will lose this isochronism. Um, and in addition, I mean, uh, um, this, this phenomenon is aggravated by the fact that the magnetic field uh, is, 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 is decreasing. So you have two solutions of the problem. One is to build a synchro cyclotron. So you modify the design so the RF will also change in time to keep uh, the synchro with uh, the isochronism with the, with the revolution frequency of the, of, the, of the particle. Or you build what is called an AVF cyclotron, which is called a azimuthally bearing field in which the, the pole is no longer a flat pole but it's shaped like uh, a cake, if you like. So you have uh, a conformation of the pole so that the magnetic field <clears throat> will be a superposition of a, of a average value and a modulation given by the fact that the particle will see alternating zone of high magnetic field where you have hills and zone of uh, low magnetic field where you have what you call valleys. And the RF, in a, in a, in a, in a uh, azimuthally bearing field cycle is kept constant. The, um, the average magnetic field will rise to compensate for the relativistic increase of the particle mass, but then the modulation guarantees the focusing. 
So it, uh, it's, a, it's a more complicated uh, design of, 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 of the magnet, uh, but the fact that you have, that you increase the magnetic field together with the relativistic increase of the mass of the part, which is given by the, by the relativistic factor gamma, will keep still the frequency, the revolution frequency of the particle constant and in phase with the one of the radio frequency. The, um, the synchrocyclones, the other design, I'm not gonna go into that. We can, we can have another complete lecture on the, on the, on the, on, on, on the operating principle for the cycle mouse. Let's go back to, to the medical application of, of radio flights. The very first medical application of a, of a radionuclide is actually as a radio tracer, so if you like, more like an environmental application, occurred in 1911, when this guy was a young uh, student from Hungary, who was actually um, working with um, uh, natural radioactive materials in Manchester, you know, so Manchester. So he was a, was a young Hungarian student, was doing his, uh, his study on, on this, and he was having meals in the, um, in the canteen of the university, and, you know, lunch and dinner. And at a certain point, he started to suspect that the chef was recycling food. So he starts suspecting that the, the food left in the dishes at the end of a meal were actually recycled and represented maybe the day after. So what he did once, he took a little bit of his uh, radioactive um, substance he was studying and he put a tiny amount in the residual of his food. And then the following day, he was bringing uh, his uh, detector that was using to detect nuclear material, which was not as sophisticated as we won, that we saw last week. Huh? It, was a, it, was a, it was a much simpler and actually found radioactivity in one of the meals, which actually proved that the same food that was left over from his meal a few days before, it was actually recycled in, into, into, a, into a new plate. And this is actually the first example of the use of a radio isotope as a radio tracer to, to trace something in nature. Now, he later became a physician, a doctor, and he started to use radioactive isotope uh, of lead as tracers in bomb studies. So it's actually, it's actually is the father, if you like, of uh, nuclear medicine. So the historical development of radioisotopes uh, or radionuclides in medicine is in this light. So in 1932, cycadol was invented, which actually made possible to start producing uh, radionuclides. Um, the first medical cyclotron was installed at the University of Washington in 1941. Um, it's called medical cycle because we're actually dedicated to the produ production of uh, radioactive isotopes for medical studies. Um, you know that the nuclear uh, reactor was developed uh, by Enrico Fermi during World War II. So the fission process came to be known at that time. So after the war, uh, nuclear reactor was start to be built. And following the development of the fission process, um, uh, radionuclide of, of medical interest uh, began to be produced in nuclear reactors. In 1951, Kasson and colleagues developed the retina scanner, which is still the basis for you know, uh, nuclear medicine. Um, in 1957, a very interesting development occurred, which we will see at the end of this lecture, the, uh, the, the, the development of the technetium molybdenum, uh, molybdenum technetium generator, developed in a Brookhaven National Lab. And the 58, uh, so the uh, birth of the first gamma camera, which is still used now, I mean, the principle is still used now, uh, which is now known as anger ventilation camera, which is still used today. <clears throat> now, here we discuss only nuclear medicine. So in fact, the major distinction between the two um, techniques using diagnosis is the uh, transmission and emission. So in Diagnostic imaging, you have an X-ray source. Um, the X-rays emitted by the source go through the patient and an imager behind the patient, which was, was a film, and now they are, you know, silicon flat panel, would image the differential absorption of radiation through the structure of the patient. So the bones which absorb more radiation are seen as uh, uh, darkest in the image. Again, we can have a complete lecture on, on these techniques, but this is just to tell you a difference. 
in um, Luca Medicine, on the other end, an isotope is actually introduced inside the patient with different techniques, and a detector around the patient will actually detect the radiation emitted by the patient. And the trick is to put the radiation where you want to image the tissue or the organ. So as an example, we see positron emission tomography, um, which would produce, you need a cyclotron in the hospital normally because you use very short-lived radionuclides. The only exception is fluorine 18, which is with a half-life of two hours. It can be produced in one place and shipped to about 300 kilometer distance as a pharmaceutical. So you have to produce the, your fluorine 18, for instance. Then you have to process it in radiochemistry because what you get out is not a pharmaceutical that can be injected into a patient, so you need to, to process it. You have to convert it into a radiopharmaceutical. Uh, so you have a, a radioactive uh, um, uh, atom attached to a molecule that would act as a pharmaceutical that can be then revealed from outside the body. It, it has to go through uh, stringent um, biological and you know, quality assurance process to make sure that it can actually be given to a patient. And then the, the fluorine 18 is actually injected into a patient and the patient then goes into a scanner, which is, looks like uh, you know, a CT scan, but the difference is that in a CT scan, you have an external source of X-rays that go through the patient, and you have a detector on the other side. In a PET scanner, what you have, you have a, 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 an internal source, which in this case is a beta tron, is a, is a beta plus emitter, is a, is a positron emitter, which will annihilate with, the, with the, um, an electron of the body, and will produce uh, two uh, gamma ray photons of 511 kV energy, emitted in practically back to back that will be detected by two um, by a ring of actually uh, detectors. So how do you produce the radionuclides? So we go back to, to the first step. We are in a cyclotron, we need to produce radionuclide. Well, we, I mean, for those who were here last week, uh, we've seen the, uh, the same formula, essentially, the, uh, the fundamental decay equation. So um, if you have uh, um, a certain number of reactive atom at, at time t, um, sorry, a certain number of reactive atoms at time t is dictated by the number of reactive atoms you have at time zero, and then by the uh, essentially the decay law, which is an exponential decay law, uh, which follow time and follow the uh, decay constant. So radionuclide with uh, a high decay constant, or if you like, a short <coughs> uh, half-life or, 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 or mean time, we became faster than a radionuclide with a, with a, um, a half-life which is actually longer. And the activity is simply linked to the, to the, the activity of a radionuclide is linked to the number of nuclides by, by the simple relationship, so it's lambda n. So typically you have a, a, a certain amount of radioactive nuclei and they start to decay and they decay essentially on a linear scale along uh, and follow an exponential decay because it's uh, ELM minus uh, lambda t. If you plot the, uh, uh, the residual radioactivity from the initial uh, uh, amount on a, on a linear log scale, you have a straight line. This is how the radioactivity decays with time. Now, again, for those who were there last week, we've seen some examples of radioactive decay, but in general, you have uh, two types of decay. We said you have the beta plus or beta minus, according to where you are on the radionuclide chart. So if you start with the nucleus with the A um, uh, nuclei of which Z are protons, huh? well, you can decay by electron capture or by beta plus decay, and the um, uh, resulting uh, nuclei, which can be stable or still unstable and keep decaying, would be a nuclei, nuclei, a nucleus with the same number of uh, of um, nucleons in the in the in the in the in the in the, in the, in the nucleus, but it will have one less charge because the beta plus decay brings away. Um, a positive charge. So in fact, I mean, you have a, a protons converting into a nucleus, uh, in, in neutrons in, in, the, in, in the atomic nucleus. The beta minus decays, on the other end, you will end up uh, with, a, with an atom with, a, with, a, with an extra proton because in beta minus you have essentially 
in neutrons converting into protons and giving away the negative charge by beta amino decay. Very often, the, um, um, the resulting nuclide, you know, the, the, the daughter, ends up in an excited state, which will decay uh, by an emission of a gamma ray in order to reach uh, a stable uh, energy state. Now, what are the criteria that an ideal diagnostic radiopharmaceutical should fulfill? Well, should be available readily at low cost. I mean, if it costs too much, well, you cannot uh, use for routine uh, medical examination. It should be a pure gamma emitter because uh, alphas and betas will only contribute to radiation dose to the patient and will give no diagnostic information. It will, it will not be able to exit the patient. It will just deposit dose locally inside the patient. It will not be seen by the imager outside. So it has to be a pure gamma emitter. It should have a short, effective biological half-life. Remember, I think we mentioned last week, the elimination of a radionuclide from the body occurs by two mechanisms. One is the physical half-life. If a radionuclide decays in one hour, after, you know, with a one hour half-life, after one hour you have half, after another hour we have one quarter, after a day it's gone. But it is also eliminated by biological processes. So the, the, the effective biological half-life uh, by which radionuclide is eliminated by the body is actually um, shorter than the physical half-life of radionuclide. So for a, um, a radionuclide you want to use in diagnostics, not in therapy, in diagnostics, we're talking about diagnostics, this uh, uh, effective biological half-life should be as short as possible. Because after the exam, you want to get rid of the radioactivity to, to stop giving those to the patient. So you should have a high target to non-target ratio. So you have to uh, place most of the retinoclide into the uh, tissue or organ you want to image. It is never the case. When you inject radioactivity, you know, radiopharmaceutical into a patient, um, there will be dispersion. There will be, you know, this radiopharmaceutical will go a bit everywhere. So the idea of radiopharmaceutical, in fact, is the one that would all end up into your target organ, the one you want to image, and nothing around. Because the radioactivity that is dispersed in the rest of the body will just blur the image, will just produce background. And of course, it has to be follow a metabolic process you want to image. Um, uh, for instance, you want to image uh, the thyroid, uh, the, the iodine is very well uh, uh, trapped by thyroid, so you give RD123, that will go into the thyroid that will follow the metabolic uh, um, uh, function of the thyroid. <clears throat> so this is actually summarizing this curve. So if this is the, the image in time, so the, the, the exam will last maybe, I don't know, one hour. So if you have a, a retinoclide with a long decay time, or a short take time, while well, the radiation dose to the patient is the area under the curve. So if you have a radionuclide with a short decay time, that means it will be eliminated by the patient soon after the end of the exam, so you don't give an extra dose to the patient. But if it has a long half-life, it will keep staying the patient for long after the end of the exam, and it will just contribute to the radiation dose. So remember, this is again a fundamental equation, the way the, uh, you know, the radionuclides decay. Now, how do you produce radionuclides? Well, we have production in, uh, in, 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 uh, in um, reactors, but let's look at the production in, uh, in, a, in, a, in a cyclotron. <clears throat> so typically you accelerate particle in a cyclotron, for instance, a proton, which can be particle A. You can then extract the particle and uh, take it to the radiation station, or you can just uh, hit an internal target. <clears throat> the target can be a solid, liquid, or a gas. So you can have an internal target into the cyclotron or external into a radiation station and can either be solid, liquid, or a gas. Then you do a nuclear reaction. You typically hit with the proton. For instance, you do a PN reaction on a, on a um, uh, nucleus with A uh, nucleons and Z uh, protons. And then you will end up, if it's a PN, with the, a nucleus with the same number of nucleus with, 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 with an extra charge. Then you have to uh, process the target to extract your answer that you need from the rest because you know you know most of the target material will not be converted into the uh, um, nuclei that you need and then you have to do what I mentioned you have to 
label a radio pharmaceutical, so you have to label a, you know, a, a biological um, um, pharmaceutical with the, the radioactive component, and you have to undergo, it has to undergo a strict quality control because actually, before you can actually administer to the patient. And these are the various uh, reactions that could occur when, a, for instance, a, a, a proton could eat a nucleus, normally a compound nucleus is formed, and then there are various um, ways the, the, the compound nucleus gets rid of the extra energy. You could have elastic scattering, which would be of no use for our purpose because you end up with the same target and the same nucleus. You would have inelastic scattering, which is also not very useful because you want to produce a new species, or you have nuclear reaction. You can have various types of nuclear reactions, and one of them will give you the radionuclide, you know, the, 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 um, that, that you need for, for your exam. Um, <clears throat> for instance, if you accelerate a deuteron onto a nitrogen-14 uh, target, you will have uh, an oxygen-16 in an exactly state form, which could de-excite by different uh, reaction mechanisms. So you could have the emission of a neutron and you end up with oxygen 15. This is the Q value of the reaction or the threshold. So some reaction need uh, a certain input energy to take place, some are exonergetic. But for instance, oxygen 15 is a good radionuclide for PET imaging. If you have an alpha emission, you get a carbon 12, which is a stable um, nucleus of carbon, so no use at all for nuclear medicine. The emission of tritium will give you natural 13, which is also a very, it's a positron emitter, which is also used in, in PET. <clears throat> the emission of a neutron and the proton will give you um, a natural 14, which is just a natural, you know, a stable nitrogen that is not used at all. I mean, it's actually the same the, 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 of the target. The emission of a gamma will give oxygen 15, which is also um, um, a stable, uh, a stable uh, nucleus. So um, a fundamental parameter to, um, to estimate the amount of uh, radionuclide you can produce is the uh, cross-section, which is uh, linked to the production rate by this formula. Again, because of time, I would not go into too many details, but I leave you for you to study. But essentially, you can also measure a cross-section if you know all of the other parameters, if you know the, the impinging particle, uh, and then you measure the reaction rate. So you can either know the cross-section, estimate the re uh, reaction rate, or if you like, the number of uh, the activity you can produce, or the other way around, from a measure of the reaction rate, by having a control of all the other parameters, they actually measure the cross-section. And the measure of the cross-section is a very important, uh, so the, the cross-section is a very important parameter in radio production. It's called excitation function. The excitation function is, the, is, the, um, is a plot of the cross-section as a function of particle energy. And this tells you what energy you need or what machine you need, if you like, to produce a sufficient amount of radionuclide. For instance, this is the excitation function for the production of fluorine 18, which is again a, um, a beta plus uh, in proton meter using PET, via the PN reaction oxygen 18. So you know that, I mean, you need an, a couple of MeV energy to produce the maximum of fluorine 18. There's no point to have 100 meb cyclotron because I mean, 100 meb you produce nothing. You really need, you need just, you know, maybe 10 meb cyclotron in order to have the maximum reaction rate in this, in this, in this region here. Um, so again, this is the, um, the, what I mentioned before, you can just revert the previous formula and you measure the, the, uh, the cross section by measuring the reaction rate. Um, since the buildup and decay of radioactivity are exponential, uh, we already saw last week, essentially when you start bombarding a target, you will start building up radioactivity up to a point you reach saturation. Because at a certain point you reach a rate of decay which is the same as the rate of production. And of course, I mean, the shorter is the half-life of a radionuclide, the faster is the build-up, the faster is saturation, the faster the radionuclide decay when you stop bombarding. So this is why, for instance, if you want to use oxygen 15 the, for a PET um, examination, PET imaging, 
you have to have a cyclotron in the hospital adjacent essentially to the pet camera because with the two minutes of life you know with 10 minute bombardment you have produced the maximum but in, in you know in 10 minutes after you stop producing you are left with half after two minutes without the half so essentially it goes down very very fast fluorine 18 has two hours so it will uh, build up the maximum with the relatively short radiation of 10 12 hours but then it will take still a couple of hours to decay. So you will have the time to do some uh, processing and ship it to, to, a, to a hospital away from the center. Another important thing is the, the fact that when you bombard a target with, uh, a, for instance, a proton beam, well, you do not only produce typically the radionuclide you're interested in, but also you produce contaminants, which are not necessarily good for the, for the examination. They may not have the, the, the right emission for imaging. They might just give those to the patient. So for instance, to produce thallium 201, you use the reaction of protons at, um, at a few times MeV energy on thallium 203. So you do a P3N reaction on thallium 203 um, <clears throat> and the cross section of the, uh, P3N reaction is the blue one here, the, um, the excitation function. So you still, the, this reaction peaks at about just below 30 MeV. There is no production below 20 MeV and it goes down above 40 MeV. So if you have a 10 MeV cycle, you cannot produce thallium 201 because you don't have enough energy. You need at least a 30 to 40 MeV proton, proton beam. So lead 201 will decay in thallium 201. So you produce thallium 201 by this reaction generating lead 201 with decay. But unfortunately, when you bombard a thallium 203 target with say 40 proton, you have two other reactions uh, taking place. You have uh, a P2N, the black one, the P2N that would produce lead 202, which is a contaminant. I mean, we just give those to the patient and bring no benefit to, to, to imaging. And then you will also have a, a P4N uh, with the, will produce lead 200. So the trick here is to try to set your energy range, so the bombarding uh, energy and the thickness of the target so that you do not deposit the full energy in the, in the, in the target so that to stay below. So you don't really want to use 40 mL because of 40 mL you will produce a lot of this uh, uh, lead 200 you don't need. You want to set up your, um, the incoming energy around 30 mL so you will produce the, 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 the peak and then you would stop producing. So you have the target which is not thick to, to take all of your beam, but you want to stay also uh, away from from uh, producing too much of this uh, um, uh, lead 202 by the P2N. So you have to really play around with the beam energy and the and the and the target size in order to maximize the production of the radium cloud you want to produce and try to minimize the contaminants. Target, as I said, can be internal to the beam to to the cyclotron or external. So you need a beam transport system to bring the beam to the target. Um, you can have solid, liquid, or gas. In the mean that you will always have a, a solid piece of equipment, but in this case, for instance, you have an irradiation cell where you put um, a water target enriched with the oxygen 18, which is a, a rich, uh, which is a more rare um, uh, radioisotope of, of, of oxygen to produce fluorine 18. When you deposit energy by a particle beam into any material, especially if it's a liquid or a gas, uh, sorry, liquid or a gas, um, you have, um, you heat up the material. So you will have to remove heat from either the gas, um, in particular the gas, because are not very good heat conductors, um, or um, if it's a liquid target, you can just recirculate it. If it's a solid target, you can flush with, you know, with the, with the water. Um, because otherwise the target may change the properties or even melt. And the next table, there is just a few examples of uh, some data that you can, you know, have a look yourself. So this, I simply give you the radionuclide that it is produced, for instance, out in 1T3, which is used in SPECT imaging, the single photo, single photo animation on computer tomography. The half-life is a thin hour, so it's quite good for, for imaging, it will decay relatively fast after the exam. 
you can use you can use various production reaction and these are the energies that you need so here in a table like this you can select if you like the energy to produce a certain radionuclide according to the machine you have at your disposal for instance you can produce carbon 11 either with the pn reaction on boron 11 at 10 mev or you can you can produce it with the a p alpha reaction on nitrogen 14 uh, with the energy between 11 and 19 mv so this is just a series of tables that are leaving for you to study with different uh, with different uh, uh, production routes for radionuclide for a diagnosis. As I said, about 5% of the radionuclides used in medicine are actually used for therapy. But in this case, the properties are completely different. You want high LET decay products. You remember linear energy transfer we defined last week. So you want Auger electrons, beta particle, or alpha particle, because you want to deposit a huge amount of energy locally where the nuclide uh, is the positive, which is essentially uh, in the tumor. So you have to put your radionuclide, which is a, it's a alpha or beta emitter, uh, a beta minus emitter to a, a, a molecule that can be directed to a tumor site. Um, beta emitting radionuclides are neutron rich and they're usually um, producing reactors. Um, alpha emitter are produced either in a reactor or with, uh, with uh, cyclotrons. And these are some examples of uh, <clears throat> radionuclide which have been proposed or used in um, uh, radionuclide uh, uh, target therapy. And now to conclude, I discussed the um, uh, Technitzon 99 um, uh, radionuclide because essentially the vast majority of uh, um, um, nuclear medicine examination are still done with the Technician 99 metastable. Um, I think about 80% of the uh, exam in nuclear medicine. Now, this Technician 99 metastable, <coughs> it's, a, it's a short uh, half-life, six hours. So in practice, you cannot um, um, produce it somewhere else. Uh, you cannot produce in a reactor and ship it to it cannot be produced by, uh, with the present, uh, apparently it's, not, it's only producing reactor and not with cyclone, so you can actually produce it locally. So how, how can you do it? Well, the trick is that you actually produce in a reactor Technitzan 99 metastable, because this one decays into, um, continues into Technitzan. So in practice, you produce in a nuclear reactor, um, molybdenum 99, which is a half-life of six or seven hours, so it's um, near three days, and this decay in the 99 metastable. So what you can do, you can produce this one, repair it, and ship it to a hospital. And the hospital will have what is called a radionuclide generator. So it will have a, a, a parent radionuclide, the molybdenum 99, that would continue to produce, to a certain extent, because it decays, um, uh, the radionuclide you're interested in, which is um, uh, technetium 99 metastable, which is the daughter, they can be easily separated uh, from, from, from the, um, the parent. So a radionuclide generator looks like this. Um, essentially, you have uh, um, a system that will allow the uh, molybdenum to decay into technetium that can be just easily extracted by the container in fact. So what happens that you remove the daughter but the parent keeps decaying. So after about 23 hours, um, so when you start having the molybdenum, after about 23 hours you have the maximum activity of technetium. At, at this point, the production rate and the decay rate are the same. So you reach what between parent and daughter, between molybdenum and technetium, is called transit equilibrium. So the two decay at the same time. So once you've reached this transit equilibrium, the, the activity of the daughter decreases with the same half-life of the uh, parent, which is uh, six to seven hours. And what actually happens is that in the beginning, you start with the molybdenum. The technician will build up, and after about a day, you have the maximum. Then you can take off the technician you need for the exam, and you will start rebuilding. 
and after another 24 hours, you have again enough magnesium for another exam. And this goes on for a couple of days. So I think it lasts about one week before the activity of the parent is too, is too reduced to be, to be useful. So this is a very useful system um, to, uh, uh, to use in hospital. And as I mean, most of the uh, red, um, you know, exams in, uh, in Luca Medis are still done with magnesium 99. Um, eluted from uh, molybdenum. Now there are a few others. I mean, it's not the only one which are less used, but they're still uh, quite new. So you have uh, <coughs> germanium 69 with the gain gallium 68. This is a beta plus, so this is actually using PET. Um, rubidium 81, um, which would give krypton 81 metastable. Um, strontium 82 will give you rubidium 82. And molybdenum material, one we saw. So you see, I mean, the parent has to have, uh, well, this is a very short half life. So, I mean, this actually has to be produced essentially locally. But all the others, if the half life which is long enough that you can actually build a radio generator that you ship to the owner. And I think this is my last slide. Yeah, because the next one is going to be radiation therapy, and we'll discuss that on Thursday. Thank you very much. Doctor. So, so I think we're about on time. We have time for a few questions, I think. Yeah, so I think we have a few time, a few minutes, uh, and we, and you can write down the, your question, or you can uh, yeah. show mm. that you want to speak. So maybe before, I mean, anybody can uh, raise some question. Uh, we saw that there was quite a lot of reference as well for Hugo Amaldi. So you want to say a few words about his work? Uh? and uh, potentially your own connection and own engagement as well. Yeah. Well, okay, I work with Dugo for uh, seven areas, but more, mostly in, uh, in, um, in conjunction with uh, um, hard-on therapy. So we will discuss next week, I mean, uh, sorry, on Thursday. I worked with him for a few years. Essentially, we did all the design study for the um, uh, National Center for Oncological Hard-on Therapy in, uh, in Pavia, close to Milano, which is now 13 patients since 2011. I just told some of his slides because he has also, he has a very good lecture. So sometimes we exchange slides or there are a few that they made for a presentation on this thing, on the history of medical physics. I took just a few from him. Mm -hmm. I think he's still active. I mean, I don't see him very frequently, but he comes to Sun from time to time and he's still, uh, uh, he's still um, working. Is there any question? Okay, I put more material what I presented because I, I, I would just let the people not to look at the slides uh, uh, independently. So I mean, I, I didn't really no time to go through all the details. But um, I mean, especially your say you can set up another lecture just to discuss the operation of the of the cyclotron, for instance. But at least people have uh, the basic information. The the formula are very basic, are very simple. You know, the basic the basic formula are are, are simple, and people can have a look and and understand themselves, the principle of isochronism. And I will do the same on Thursday for the um, operating principle of the, of the synchrotron. Yeah. So any question? So we, we can recognize few of you are working maybe in that field. So feel comfortable as well, if you don't want to speak now as well, to build up your question, to send them to Marco. So that okay, you can send by email or uh, by, you can ask them also on Thursday. Eh? Mm -hmm. Exactly. So that's Thursday. on the first phase. So. Yeah. Thursday we also have a, a Thursday we start half an hour later. We have again an hour, and then we have uh, time for questions. So if you want to ask question after, exactly. Lecture is also okay. On Thursday it's gonna be exactly at uh, at four so teaching time. Yeah. yeah. So in case they want to have time to digest uh, this all this material. We have one question. So very good. So uh, the comment. Uh, Maybe I stop sharing the screen so I also see the, I can also see the chat. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, the field is still in development. Yeah. Yeah, now I, I have some slides. The one that I presented to Christine, if you remember at the African Conference of Physics uh, two years ago. Mm -hmm. So at the end of um, uh, the lecture on Thursday, I will address a bit point the lack of uh, um, you know, radiation therapy in, in, in Africa. I mean, but this is also true for, um, I mean, for uh, diagnostics. Huh? 
and um, you know there are initiatives eh, that uh, to try, for instance, to design simpler um, electron linux for radiation therapy that can actually work in difficult conditions because you know a machine for treating patient for cancer or for diagnostics need to be reliable so if you have for instance uh, unstable power supply well it's a problem to run a pet scanner or a, or or a, or a, or a linux for therapy um, so I, I have a few slides on that at the end of the lecture on Thursday, but this is a, absolutely a problem, sure. Um, we have uh, some of the ASP students and alumni um, who are connected now. Uh, Justina, do you want to comment at the YEMO? Um, you guys have been involved in the medical application of nuclear physics in, in, in Africa, in Nigeria. What, what's the situation there? Well, what is your experience? Do you want to say something? Well, the, it's quite very interesting. We, since 2010, has been a first uh, time with ESP. Uh, <clears throat> basically, I think the first linear accelerator to Nigeria came in 1999 to Abuja. Um, that was the first one we had. And um, subsequently, the next ones that we had also went to about four different regions uh, for photons and electron treatment. Um, for over those years, I think up till this moment, we're still struggling with the uh, training of clinical physicists, unlike what you have with developed countries. But we have actually improved from the one in 1999 to having close to about maybe nine accelerators now in the country. We presently, where I'm staying now, we have two on this bunker, um, on top of the bunker here. So we've got two here, and there's also two in Lagos from Varian. Here is Electa, and um, we are having a lot of proposals. In fact, just in between the lectures, we had another extreme meetings, even where the terrorist zone is from Boko Haram. They are also building up about two bunkers there for treatment. So it's actually a very interesting pattern for physics to grow up with. But we lack one thing. For over the years, we have actually been struggling with the PET scan. Um, we've actually not been doing so well. We've got two nuclear medicine facilities, one in the western side, Ibadan, and one in Abuja, where I am. It's always very difficult having radio radioisotopes from Nigeria. Very difficult having, we usually import technicians from South Africa. And you know, within those hours, 66 flights need to come to Abuja. Sometimes when it comes, maybe three days or four days, they clearing in the ports and they, they, the whole thing has really gone down. So we had issues and we don't have a cyclotron at all. But I think they are working for funds to be able to get cyclotron. I think that's actually one big point I knew a place like Nigeria is looking forward for assistance and um, get smaller things or cheaper ones to maintain that will, will work unlike what I see in Europe, in the US and so on. Um, PET scan at this. But we've got a lot of CT and MRI do. But in terms of nuclear medicine, PET would be slow getting cyclotron. Mm. Uh, Lekan, did you receive the other material that I sent you? Yes, I got it. You got okay. it. So I got the book and these other slides, which are very, very well done. Eh? So you have yes. this link also to the lecture. Okay. Yes, this, the slides was actually very impactful. Although I personally need one or two of your assistants in, they need towards the last end of those slides. But I, you know, I've, I've actually been able to work with one of the two. Okay, well, you can back, come back to me. Uh, now, you, you work in the hospital in, in, the, in the capital? Yes, in, it is the capital, National Hospital in Abuja. In, in Nigeria? Yes. Would you need a mechanical engineer there? Because yes. the, when I go to Milano, when I go to Milano, uh, close to my place, there is always a Nigerian guy who is a 24, and he's a bright guy, who is there, you know, asking for some money for people. So I talk to him, I discuss. Well, he's actually a mechanical engineer. So of course, it's one of the cases with, you know, flying to Europe to try to find, yes. and again, he has a small, uh, then I was try to see whether I could put him in contact with, with, uh, with somebody to get him a job. Of course, the problem with the immigrants is that if you are not, uh, if you have not, um, you know, a, a resident permit, you can look for a job. If you don't, don't have a job, you cannot get a resident permit. 
So yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I think for, 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 for here, uh, and, uh, for young engineers, especially the electrical electronics, because we are bringing in a lot of accelerators. Many yeah. accelerators are coming into the country now. I can't. Is, is that, is that, and is so that is a mechanical engineer? He studied yeah. in Nigeria, and so I don't know if I can maybe try to put him in contact with you. Huh? Yeah, of course, yes, you can, you can do that, absolutely, because I even have a project at hand with uh, Shinra in China. We are trying to bring the Linux from there. So we, we will need one or two engineers that will be there at least for, you know, the normal first line training, online chats to assist yeah. when the Linux breaks down in the clinic. And, and it's a good thing because I've never seen any of our engineer here, especially clinical. They've been doing well, because, so you know, people escape from Africa to try to find some, you know, better job in, in Europe. Yeah. I mean, maybe, maybe you find something in your country as well. So I, I, I have this point of, I was, you know, when I go, I go to Man once, once, uh, once a month and I always meet him there. So I, we have a chat and you know, I give you five euros, whatever. But that's not the, solving the problem. So I have his phone number. So I see. You know, then I, with this um, this COVID, uh, I couldn't go back. Uh, I only went back after three months and a half. Uh, I, I didn't see him because I only went for the for the weekend. But I have his phone number, so if I manage to get in touch with him, maybe I can try to put you on. Know, maybe you can no. you know have a, have a no. chat with him, see what if there is any need, maybe in your hostel. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Good. Yeah, I really like your, your, your comment and your, your statement anymore about the situation and what you're experiencing as well with this field. So I think it's very valuable as well to share with us. And you see, potentially, there's going to be some connection as well. Mm. <laughs> so, so yes, and, and this is good as well with the high temple lab. I guess that you, you get quite a lot of the radioisotope as well from there. So, but as yeah. you said, it doesn't help much that this is in Africa. It's still like uh, some kind of uh, difficulty as well to ship everything. Yes, we, we've got a lot of difficulties, especially for pets. It's like, uh, it's very easy in Europe, but it's difficult here yeah, to do. The patients go through a lot to be able to get a scan for gamma cameras. And basically because we don't have a cyclophone. We don't have one for now. Uh, Justina, are you, are you there? Can you talk? Thank you, everyone. Hi, Justina. Hi. You are, you are also in Nigeria, but you are in Lagos, right? Yes. Okay, what's your experience? The line is breaking. We can hear you. Go on. Connection is not very good. Probably. Yeah, her connection is not good. Um, she is uh, ASP 2014. Okay. And she just uh, she recently got her PhD in medical at uh, medical applications as well, uh, but she's based in Lagos. So okay. I think Adeyemo, you don't know her, but it would be good to have a connection. Right? You are in Abuja. She's in Lagos. Okay, Maybe. I usually yeah. I visit that place frequently because uh -huh. uh, I'm all over I'm all over the country. <laughs> okay. All right, I will uh, I will make the I will make sure the two of you uh, are connected. I'll send an email to both of you. Oh, okay, fine, fantastic. I, I think she dropped even a number right here, and maybe I'll give her a call after. All right. After she dropped the number. Very good. Glory. Hello. So was somebody asking a question? Uh, hello. Yeah, we can hear. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, my name is Kondwani Sisimare. I'm uh, ASP student 2020. This is my first time to join the African School of Fundamental Physics and Applications. Um, I also wrote on the charts there that um, in this, this field of medical physics is still underdeveloped in Africa. Um, maybe I can say Malawi inclusive because I'm from Malawi, but I'm studying in Rwanda right now. I've seen that um, maybe these things about humor and all that is the problem that man faces all the time. Maybe because of the food that we eat and all other radiations we are exposed every day. I've seen that maybe in some hospitals, like we don't even have a medical physicist there. We don't have even the facilities that people just die. People have tumors, people have problems. 
they died and diagnosed it and all that. I really looking forward to see that this field at least we should try. Maybe you guys you can try to help us like young young physicists, we can invent into this field and at least try to help Africa. So that's my comment. It's a nice message. I think it's good as well to hear that. And, and this is a bit the goal, you know, to find much more physicists as well, even if uh, at the beginning they don't aim as well at this medical physics, so they can become as well even more useful for the society later. So then you have all the different equipment, and this is more of the engineering work that may require as well other type of, uh, of skill, but that's. Uh, that's the, the, the combination of all of that, that, that will improve all those different ways of living, for sure. So the treatment and as well, so the, the, the pet, I mean, I guess now the easiest is really for all the monitoring, but the more important might be as well the treatment. So, so for, for your point of view, Marco, so what is uh, for treatment? So speaking about the, for the, and using the, the, the photon therapy or the proton therapy. Proton therapy might be much more expensive as well to implement, but that should not be too complicated, potentially as well, to have in a different hospital in Africa for treatment. But, no, as, as I said, I will see um, Thursday. I mean, what I call conventional radiation therapy is well advanced. So I don't think, really, I mean, if you have limited resources, I mean, I wouldn't go for proton therapy. I think, I mean, a LENAC, a modern LENAC, just a 6 MeV with you know, a tomotherapy machine, which is 6 MeV LENAC. It's, it's, a, it's a perfect tool. The point is that you need, uh, it's not just a machine, you need, you know, expertise. You need people who are actually trained to use it properly because you need a sophisticated treatment planning system because uh, like, like, like in protons, I mean, if you have a perfect beam, we can use a tumor with, with one millimeter, but the treatment plan is not well done. There's no point, you make more harm than, than you know, the good. So I think, uh, you know, uh, therapy with uh, um, uh, Linux, which now mostly use <coughs> photons for, for, so you produce photons from your electron beam, you, you do very good treatments. I mean, there are, you know, remember protons and carbon ions are only used for a selected classes of tumors that would clearly benefit from the specific, um, you know, mo uh, modality. Well, then in that case, you send the patient somewhere else because there is no, no other option. But, you know, but the large fraction of tumors are well treated with, uh, with the electron Linux um, that you buy from, uh, from vendors. The point is that, uh, you know, as we discussed, you know, Africa, Sometimes in certain places you have problems with, you know, it's a more dusty environment that would certainly not be good for electronics. Uh, you know, power supply, you need, uh, you know, water supply for cooling the, cooling the equipment or cooling the electronics. Uh, um, so you have constraints that, I mean, we do not normally face and maybe in Africa in certain places is, 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 is I mean, they are, they, are, they are more important. And then you need trained personnel. You need, you need people. I think this is one of the important, uh, the stability of the network. And we see that Justice was just uh, sending as well. Uh, no. said, apologize. So uh, I agree that this is not only the knowledge, but as well the, the equipment that needs to be. Equipment and train personnel. Yeah, I mean, investment from, uh, from the countries themselves uh, are important, either by country or by regional consultation to try to join efforts and bring resources together. Um, there are uh, activities going on in different countries and Morocco is uh, quite developed, uh, all the medical application there. Tanzania is doing something. South Africa, Itamba Lab is actually producing radioisotopes. So there are localized uh, uh, progress, um, but um, to make it Pan-African wide, uh, require coordinated resources and engagement from different governments as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, do you have any, um, did you make any thoughts? Uh, uh, you you plan to move everything to next year or? Just um, I, didn't, I didn't hear the first part because there was some static noise. Could you repeat? I mean, do you have any um, already ideas for the African School of Physics? So do you already plan to move it to next year? 
next July or because um, I think that is going to be very complicated. Yeah, it will be certainly be moved to next year, but uh, we haven't fixed the date yet. We want to see um, how the situation is still developing. Yeah. I think sometime in July or August, we will discuss the options for the dates. Um, there are a few possibilities that uh, we discussed before that include uh, end of February, beginning of March next year, or end of March, beginning of April next year, or in August next year. July would be complicated next year because there are many other activities uh, that have been already planned. But we want to we want to fix the option depending on how COVID-19 is evolving and what we can expect from the host country, uh, in this case, Morocco, um, in terms of movements of people from other African countries and from the rest of the world. Um, and also we have uh, ASP 2022, that is also around the corner for which we have already decided on South Africa. So um, we like to make sure that uh, uh, the two events, ASP 2020 and 2022, are sufficiently far apart. Yeah. Otherwise, we cannot, um, we cannot justify having funding for those two events separately. They will just be looked at as one single event if they are within a year of each other. Logistically, it will be even more difficult. It just takes a lot of time to prepare. So um, the earlier in 2021 we can have it, the best. But we have to see so we will review the situation toward the end of july beginning of august and hopefully we'll have enough information to set the date at that time and what is the situation the covid in africa because here we are a lot from south america which is a disaster <laughs> the news don't say much about africa eh? well yeah i go ahead <laughs> <laughs> the africans who are connected should talk uh, well, well, first, I just wanted to, to attack uh, Professor Gide for not even thinking of coming to Nigeria for the ESP. I mean, no, we, 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 we have been, <laughs> we are, we, in fact, we make some contacts uh, there. It just have not uh, really worked out. Uh, maybe, at the Yemo, you can, you can take the lead uh, to, 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 for the proposal. But we contacted, uh, uh, you know, a few of our colleagues there in, uh, yeah, I think in Abuja and uh, uh, well, the, so the best place to those two that is going to be in Abuja because I know we've got the Sheda and there are actually there's going to be a lot of uh, maybe one or two medical accelerating facilities to visit just the way we had. Then the connecting flights to Abuja is also smooth. Um, well, I think we should look forward for that. So maybe with Professor Ketev and Christine will actually assist to bring it there. Then with regards, no problem. <laughs> with regards to the COVID, yeah, it's, 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 it's for Nigerians case scenario, it's actually very, very funny to us because we are not having it the way we see, do see it in Europe, perhaps in the news, uh, we're actually not having it that, that, that way. But the uh, testing has not quite been that good here. Yeah? And the average on the daily basis, maybe we could talk about 400 to 500. Um, in fact, not far from where I stay, we've got also the COVID facilities there. Um, but it, it, it's actually not a big challenge here, the way I see it. It it's, it's, has just affects the economic group, um, really. But I've actually not seen it so bad. Maybe the environmental factor is making it. Our temperatures was 37 before, now just dropping to 22, 25, maybe. Um, it's actually not really too bad from what I perceive as much. But for areas where the literacy is not good, especially in the northern side, you'll be, they had issues before, but I think now maybe it's getting better. Um, <coughs> we're having too much of a problem like we had initially. But the number is increasing. Maybe we're just about 20,000 out of 200 million people. Okay. Yeah. Okay, very good. Anybody else um, wants to say something about the COVID in the country? Munia, what's the situation in Morocco now? Since we're going to come there for ASP. 
Um, is she still here? She I think not. No, she left. She left, mm -hmm. okay. Um, anybody else want to say something about well, I mean, they, they are, I, I have been working on with uh, some ESP students uh, and trying to model the evolution of COVID in their own countries. Konduani, I think you are here, Toivo. I'm not hearing you speak. You are working with me on this stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me, let me come, come and to your rescue. Okay. Um, in Rwanda right here, right now, we still have some cases. Now the cases are ju just jumping, uh, maybe third one, for the one per day. But I think the past we need to have, we were only having maybe three or four cases. Maybe because I think the, the easing restrictions now, people are free to move from there and there. So maybe that's why the cases are keep on increasing. But so far, I can say that maybe because of increasing number of the testing kits that are that are being used to test people, I think uh, it will be over maybe in the next few months. Yeah, that's the case of Rwanda. Somebody raise their hands, Christine. Um, don't see. Yeah, please. I, I can't see the screen. Yes, hello. We can hear. Hello, are you are you getting? Hello. We we can hear. Go ahead. Can you speak? Uh, this is Stephen Nyaranga. Yes. I'm Good. from I'm from I'm from Kenya. Uh, the situation of COVID nineteen is uh, not uh, very bad as I I expected the first time, because uh, uh, currently uh, less than. 5,000 who have been tested positive, and uh, those who have passed on less than 150. So we have got uh, curfews and lockdowns in some parts of the country where there is a high rate of COVID 19, especially in Nairobi County, where I'm currently in. And uh, this, the situation is not very bad in all as I expected. But uh, those who have been tested uh, so far, it is around 150,000. Uh, yesterday, 260 people were tested positive. The only challenge that uh, we are facing in Kenya is uh, lack of reagents to test uh, mass, mass, mass uh, population of people. But we are trying, we are trying our uh, level to ensure that uh, uh, the COVID 19 doesn't spread so much. Schools have been closed. Uh, some government offices have been closed down uh, to ensure that uh, we, don't, we don't spread the virus. Otherwise, uh, I think that it is going to end so that we can resume uh, the, the schools and every stuff. Maybe the next one month, I think. So that is all. That is Kenya. Christine, we cannot hear you. I had to unmute the microphone, Christine. Yeah, yeah, sorry. I was thinking that it would help for the, um, for, for Konwadi. So yeah, that was really nice to, to hear that. Potentially it would be good, Ketavi, for Thursday to have as well figures or to try to see, because I, I like the idea indeed that, that we have as well a, a feedback from uh, mm. all of uh, the situation throughout Africa. I think it was very no, nice. No, but Thursday is, is Marcus' yeah, lecture, it's right? Marcus so, no, we, we cannot have that. I, we can have a, it's too early. a different, uh, a different uh, lecture or something, on, uh, especially the exercise that the ESP students are doing. Uh, once that has matured, maybe we can actually have uh, a discussion on their results. Uh, I think it's been progressing very well. Kondwani here is one of the people who are making progress. Uh, so basically, uh, we have uh, a number of countries uh, represented and they collect the data. So I was late in the meeting today because earlier we had a ASP COVID-19 meeting. Uh, so uh, we were discussing uh, uh, 
uh, all the you know the the condition under which the data were taken and trying to understand uh, how it is evolving and if we can model the data that that we have right now and then if we can have some uh, some uh, conclusions or predictions or suggestions for the various governments so um yeah so it's so so all of these guys are, are working quite uh, nicely uh, we have rwanda mozambique kenya uh, togo benin cameroon zambia i have data from uh, these regions uh, certainly if other people are interested they, are, they can come and if they have the time to to work on their own data mm -hmm. then uh, we'll be more than happy to to get them going so but christine i i would suggest that you wait a little bit uh, yeah no problem i'm just but yeah. I, I know I, I think it's very important to have indeed the verbal communication and it sure. might be sometimes difficult so it's good to see figures so yeah yeah i mean they, they are working on the figures right now i mean even if it is just to show the cases uh, that is that they already have that but we want to put some model on it and we want to understand uh, some parameters like uh, basic uh, reproductive uh, number and and things like that and, and 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 try to understand also the data itself because in some cases we see the data the case is going down and then boom, they go back up again and it's not completely clear uh, what is driving, you know, those uh, rapid changes or periodic changes and it would be nice to understand it and then to try to uh, draw some conclusions from that. Uh, so I would suggest that we should uh, at least model some of these things better so that uh, you know when when they show some some result there will also be some good discussion about for sure but remember that it's not only i mean about modeling quite often this is the data and quite of the reason as well why it's quite i mean uh, fluctuating or it, it's not even any kind it's more random let's say it, it depends as well on the quality on how to get the data in every country is the same thing so sometimes there is no rationality behind just like that is true way. Yeah, so, that's definitely so, true. So that's why you have to put an error margin, which is for that's the true. different country, but uh, I, yeah, definitely, yeah. The the error the error estimate issue is extremely important. Uh, there could be true. a lot of systematics error in the collection of the data itself. Yeah. But sometimes not only systematic that's the problem. So there is some best guess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, very good. So but uh, I, I, but when, when, when the analysis has matured a little bit, uh, we can have a discussion on it. It will be interesting. This is true because we didn't have discussion, potentially have one session on that, but it would be very valuable. There, there, will, be, there will be one talk in August on uh, COVID-19 itself by one of the Utemba lag uh, person. I have to get the, the abstract from him. Uh, they, but he's going to talk about first principle in uh, how to model the the disease itself from a fundamental principle in terms of uh, molecular dynamics and nanoscience dynamics and stuff like that. Uh, it should be very interesting. And toward that, by that time, uh, the exercise that the ESP students are doing now should mature into uh, to to have a complete talk. Okay, so that's a good idea. So, do you think uh, after this talk to have some kind of follow up on that? Yeah, yeah, we will we, 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 we arrange it. But let's 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 have uh, Marco finish uh, his nice presentation on the four series of talks for us. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, a lot again, Marco. So, that was very useful, and then we will. Uh, so yeah, everything has been recorded except the very beginning, which was only one yeah, slide. I, yeah, sorry about that because I was uh, in the COVID Africa ASP COVID nineteen me uh, meeting and it went over by five minutes, uh, so that's why I wasn't able to connect on time. But the slides uh, we have them so online. There's no problem. Yeah. And next, I mean, on Thursday when it's going to be recorded, we will come back as well to the the outline. So I guess that there is yeah. no problem. Yeah, I mean, a short summary of what could have been missed, but mm -hmm. we will have captured everything. Okay, so thanks a lot for your time. Okay, thank you. So, see you on Thursday then.
Yeah, Marco, thank you very much. Christine, thank you. And thanks to everybody who is connected. Thank you very much for your interesting comment about that. Bye. 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 B